mostly uh, focused on stability and operating point when you have a problem of non-unicity of a operating point. And uh, at the end, we will see some uh, implementation implementation of these methods, uh, which are focused on frequency synthesizers because this is, uh, let's say, the, my specialty. And we'll talk about the caliper PLL, which is a multi-loop PLL, quadrant injection locked oscillators, uh, um, and synthesizer for IoT bus, uh, um, a synthesizer made with a delay locked loop, and then a synthesizer, which is a frac pen with a special a divider and of course we will conclude and we will discuss and if you have any question i will be more than happy to answer those questions so let's start with optimizations to let you know what we are doing when we are designing circuit trying to make those circuit working at the best so uh first we should well either it's done automatically by a machine or it's done by a human being but at every time we are working with an objective function we got an objective function and normally usually this objecting function is an error function, so which means that you know what you want, what you would like to have, and what you currently have with your circuits. And then uh, you try to make the difference between what you have currently and what you are expecting, and you try to minimize that. And most of the time, you are using a uh, least mean square uh, expression. It is not the absolute. You can use others, but this one is good because it will allow you to have positive and negative errors that do not compensate. So it's quite classical to use in this in square. So you make the difference of a given circuit with what you want. You try to see what works, and then you try to use new parameters to see if you can reduce this error. That's why reducing the error is the optimization. Optimization sometimes is just named minimization, just because of that. So most of the time, when we are talking about the objective function, the space of the objective function is like that. It's a, it's not obligatory, it's not mandatory, of course, but most of the time it's a bell shape of curves, which means that if you are modifying the parameters here, either parameter two or parameter one, your objective function goes. That's that's how it was. You can also represent that with the ease of value contour, like here. So you can see what's of them and the minimum is here. It's just about two. Sometimes it's three parameters. It's easier to represent that. And if you've got more than that, you don't represent it at all. So uh, let's talk about the stationary point of the objective function. So first of all, the uh, you can see four different, uh, um, let's say, stationary point. The strong local minimum, the absolute minimum, an inflection point and a weak local minimum. The absolute graal obviously is the absolute minimum. Uh, and the algorithm will detect those stationary points by making the differentiation around the given point where the measurement is done. So uh, it detects the minimum through the derivative calculation. If the derivative calculation is null, then you got a stationary point. The problem here with this kind of approach you just don't know which kind of points you have. It can be any of the four. Both of them got the first derivative, which is new. So you do, and you don't know, of course, except if you know the curves, you know where the minimum here, and you will go directly. But most of the time, you just don't know where it is. You are somewhere. You're making the derivation. If the derivation is new, you are on the stationary point. But it can be any of the four, and uh, that's a problem in terms of optimization. Uh, so you need to know the search direction and the amplitude of the movement that you are going to do, the amplitude of the modification of the parameter that you are going to do to make the optimization. So let's, for instance, imagine here that we got a practical section of the objective function, which is the blue one. You have your current value. Of course, you know the value you have. You make two other simulations. For instance, you can make more than that, but let's say two. And so you can have an extrapolated polynomial on which you can make the calculation of the derivation and then you obtain the minimum. And you can see that there is a little bit of error between the practical zero here and the real one. That's not really a problem. At least you go on the good direction and you got a movement, an amplitude movement, which is not perfect, but acceptable. And then you can do that more than once. For instance, here, let's see this example with the mono variation. That you, you've got two parameters. You can have more than that, but here the, the demonstration is with two parameters. You are starting from here, you select one parameter, for instance, this one, and you make a try. You don't know if you have to increase this value or decrease this value. So you make a try. And obviously, here you're not lucky. So the first try is a failure because you can see here we got 
they'll ship it. So you are going in the wrong direction. You increase your objective function. Okay, that's right. So you change and now you do the opposite and you will reduce that. And you will do this kind of thing and it will obtain something which is close to the minimum right there. And then you select the other parameters and go this direction. And you're lucky enough to do the good chain directly. And here you're once again unlucky. You make an error and you go back and, and so forth and so forth. And at the end, you will converge to the minimum of this function and you will have the best circuit you can expect with the topology you have, changing parameters such as voltage, current, resistor value, whatever. So all the parameters you can have to try to see where your circuit is at its best. Uh, so uh, that's, that's what you are doing, either with a, a, an algorithm within a, a, a software or just doing that by hand. It's also working quite well, especially when it comes to analog. So uh, what we can say is that minimum, the first derivative is nil, the second derivative is supposed to be positive. This will avoid any inflection point. Inflection points are not optimum. They are stationary points, but they are not optimum. So first, to select a minimum, a real one, you need to have further derivative, which is null, but the second one, the Hessian, which is null as well. Strong minimum from the optimization point of view, this is the top of the top. Of course, the absolute minimum, okay, but even if it's a local minimum, that's good. And then you are working on an algorithm which is looking for strictly positive Hessian, which means that l shaped curves. Um, but here we're talking about electronics and for us weak minimum finally is good for robustness because at a, at a weak minimum if you got modification in the parameters you will have very very little modification on the objective function which means that you will be stable and that your sequence will be robust in terms of discrepancy that you will have at the process step of manufacturing this is something you cannot avoid parameters will move let's say at random that's because of microelectronics. So for electronics, you will focus yourself more on weak minimum than on strong minimum. Um, so the, minim the absolute minimum is good for publication, let's say for academics, but for those of the industry, they want to sell circuits with are very, very good to have something which is insensitive to parameter variation. And so the weak minimum is better for mass production. So we mean that if you want to make robust design, you have to focus yourself not on the absolute minimum, but on a weak minimum to make sure that your circuits will be good, assuming the fact that it is good enough to answer the specification of the standard of the circuit you are addressing. Of course, it is not good enough. You still have to work on that. On that. I will go. So, um, and then we also have to take care about discrepancy. As I said, discrepancy are something that came with the technology. So as soon as it came with the technology, we have to take care of that. And to take care of that, we got two tools, statistical analysis, Monte Carlo analysis, and we got worst case analysis, which is more or less the one we use in the industry. But it is not necessarily the best. It's a kind of combination of the two. And the impact of the boss on the time to market will be also discussed to avoid the problem of over-designing or, let's say, delayed delivery. So when it comes to microelectronic, we expect a dispersion around the typical value. For process which are well-controlled, let's say mature process, not prototype process, but mature process, normally we got a non-uniform dispersion, which is a Gaussian, which means that those errors are just random errors, something which is not systematic due to a mistake somewhere, a, 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 a machine which is not perfectly tuned or whatever. Something is supposed to be Gaussian. Regarding the components which are on the outside of the chip, that's another story because those components are arriving. You don't, you are not sure that those uh, components will be made uh, on the same day and things like that. So normally you will take care of the uniform distribution for those external parameters. And you also have to take care about absolute and relative dispersion. So we will use both a Gaussian and a, a uniform distribution when needed. But let's focus on microelectronics. And for microelectronics, it is supposed to be a Gaussian distribution because the process are mastered by the founders, uh, Samsung, ST Microelectronics, NXP. They are experts in their domain. Their technology are very well, very well controlled. So it's a Gaussian distribution. And we have two distributions, at least 
but practically speaking, was three, but we have two for sure. The first one is uh, the die to die, when you are uh, having um, within a die, you will have components which are close together, will have, let's say, little dispersion. But if you are using components which are far away one from the other, the dispersion can be quite high, especially if the die is large. You will also have wafer to wafer. The wafer are in the oven somewhere, and they do not see the exact same concentration, practically speaking. On a die, you can expect the concentration to be, let's say, homogeneous. But on a wafer to wafer, that's not guaranteed. So you will have a wider dispersion from wafer to wafer than die to die. And finally, lot to lot, a wafer which is done on Monday, a wafer which is done on Sunday, they might not have the same parameters neither. And then the lot to lot dispersion can also be considered, but it's some not always available uh, in the model we have. So, uh, and we would consider if you got a Gaussian, a real Gaussian, 60%, two thirds of the population within within one sigma, and 99%, almost all of the population, but still 1% when it's mass production, it's significant. It's supposed to be at three sigma. And when you got the lot to lot, you got a nominal value, and the lot is shifted, and you got the absolute dispersion and the relative dispersion. You have to take care of all of that to be sure that your circuit at the end of the day will uh, verify the specification that you are uh, targeting in, in your design. So, uh, how can we do that? Uh, we can do that with two tools, more or less. Uh, the dispersion are taken into account using Monte Carlo analysis, statistical Monte, uh, analysis. So, um, those are based on this Gaussian projection. You are, some, you are just having some number and you expect the Gaussian to go and you then after make some external extrapolation. And of course, if you are doing that, you are taking a little bit of risk. So for that to be efficient, you need a very fine modeling uh, of the technology, including potential correlation. Because all those parameters are moving, yes, but some of them are due to the same parameters, such for instance, the oxide uh, thickness. Uh, if two parameters are linked to the oxide thickness, you cannot have move from opposite direction. They will be correlated, which means it's very difficult to have a real practical and efficient Monte Carlo distribution of of your of your technology because it requires tons and tons of measurement it takes time and it costs a lot of money uh, and also it's quite difficult to make the investigation and analysis on a, a Monte Carlo simulation with large circuit you will have several tens of, of runs that are going together and there is a jeopardy of delayed delivery because it will take too much time to develop the circuit and be sure that everything is going well and then you will have an acceptable year so if it's delayed, it will have an impact on time to market. On the other hand, that's why most of the time the industry prefer working on worst case simulation. You have slow, slow, fast, fast, and in the between in front of the typical. Uh, it's useful for mass production because if it works on slow, slow and fast, fast, you are sure that every circuit will work. Not only 99%, all of them, theoretically. <laughs> theoretically. So it's, it's good, the, the yield will be complete. But uh, on the other hand, this kind of simulation are not taking account of the, the, the correlation of the occurrence. For instance, you are maybe spending one week to try to resolve a problem that will arrive one every thousands of chip. So you are spending a lot of time there, and maybe you are forgetting uh, the time where the, the impact of something which is major. So that the problem you are not controlling the risk when you are doing worst case analysis. Every risk is similar. It's a kind of uniform distribution. That's a problem because. Due to that, you may spend too much time to resolve a problem which is not really a problem. And we talked about over-designing. And over-designing, of course, is time-consuming, so it will have an impact on time to market. So why do I talk about time to market? Uh, well, in the US there, they are saying that uh, the uh, French uh, uh, engineers are the best in the world as soon as they know the value of the dollar. And uh, so we have to talk about money to understand why time to market is so important. So here is something that came from uh, McKinsey and company. It's quite old, but it's still valid. Uh, it, let's say it's a regular life of a given product. So the reference project, you start developing, it takes a little time to do that. For, and for At this moment, the company is paying everything and have no return on the investment <coughs> because they pay your salary, they pay the machine, they pay the first run, prototyping, and blah, blah, blah. 
So it costs that. Then you're successful, your circuit is working, you start selling and the market is ramping up. Everybody enjoy your product, it's so beautiful, you are selling tons and tons of them. And at a given moment, the market is arriving to maturity. And then the competition occurs and then we observe a price erosion. It's really typical of the cycle of life of any given product. Most of the time, this reduction price erosion is 12 and a half percent. That's an estimation, of course. And then at the end of the day, a new technology already arrives, something arrives, and the market is just declining up to the very end. So this is a regular one, the reference one. If, for instance, you are doing a year which is not good enough, so some of your parts are not saleable, you have to keep them on the side. So the price of your brick, because you want to make profits, is a little bit too high. For instance, here, 10% too high. So you will sell less of them because the customers we don't try to buy your product. Your product is a little bit too expensive. So you will arrive at the market maturity. You do not have make as much profit as you can, but you, of course, reduce with others and you die with others as well. If you have an overcost, means that you put too much engineers on the given chip, which will reduce the time to market, but will cost you too much compared to another one, which is able to do the same product with only half of your engineer. For instance, if you got 50% of cost increase of development, 50% is quite large. You can see that everything is being together. It's, you will see finally quite acceptable. But what is killing is that you got a, a, a late, six months late here, six months late project. So you have the same six months late which appears here and everything then after is constrained by the same date. So this six month late can become because you got the idea after the other or because you over design and it takes too much time for you to develop your project. Both of them are generating the same problem. And then here we are. It's a real calculation on the area, which means how much money did you lose compared to what you can make? You make money at each time, but you make less than expected, which is a problem when it came to competitions. With a delayed product, over design or delayed delivery, which means too much of Monte Carlo analysis or too much of worst case design to be sure that everything is clean, 33%, one third of the profit has been destroyed, let's say, for free. If you got a product cost which is 10% too high, which means your yield is not complete because you are making Monte Carlo simulation and 1% of those disappear because they are not target the real specification and you have just 22% of losses of profit. The 50% development cost overrun, which appears to be huge at the very beginning, finally only generates 3.5% of non-profit, which is finally quite nothing. So the better is for sure to make the design with more engineer than required to be sure that everything will be doing good time, even you if you over design or let's say uh, focus yourself too much on statistical and worst case simulation. You have to do that, but you have to be very careful that the, 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 that the let's say the responsibility of the project leader that you have to do that. Be sure that you have to do that to ensure that you have a yield which is acceptable, but do not do that too much. And if you need to do that a little bit more, please increase your human resource rather than increasing your time. It's obvious that increasing resource is much less critical than increasing time. Time to market is really the key point as soon as you are making money. So how can we do, um, um, can we be sure that our secret is hopefully going to work and be robust. So first, talk about marginal tests. Marginal tests mean that you have to make measurements that are not the kind of, um, you are going to make measurements, simulation, of course, uh, on the circuits out of the specification. You are specified, for instance, to work up to zero dBm of input signal, goes higher than that. Design everything for zero, and then just make once a try to 10 or 20 dBm because it might arrive accidentally, but it might arrive. And look at what arrives to your circuits. If your circuit is making something you are not really expecting, it means that you do not really have understand your circuit. So it will help you because you will see, oh, well, how this circuit is working. 
And then you think about it and you understand it and you will learn from that, which is good for the next product. Okay, that's really important. Here is an example that we, let's say, practically leaves some, something like 20 years ago. It was an LNA. So uh, we can see here, it's uh, for the reason of simplicity, it's a moss here, but practically speaking, it was a viper at this time. So here it's a common gate uh, uh, transistors. You got an inductor, then it's going to down converter. So let's see how it works. So it's just an overview of what's arriving here. So at the beginning, we expect that the antenna signal is just zero or very small. So the source voltage is just controlled by the polarization value. And the drain current is also controlled by this resistance and things like that. Everything is in good shape. You are going well. And then arrive the signal of the antenna, which is a bit too large than expected. Here it's going down. And uh, the source cannot go down because the VGS will just increase dramatically. So because it's increased, it will and a lot of current, and this current will obviously go in this direction and charge the capacitance. So this voltage will drop a little bit, but not that much. As we can see here, it dropped a little bit. But on the other hand, this capacitance will be fully charged, and this voltage across the capacitance will just go very high at this moment, like that. And of course, the current which is drawn by the transistor will increase also. But then, the voltage of the antenna is going up again. And then it cannot go up again because this uh, uh, capacitance will don't want to have its voltage to change instantaneously. So it will keep the same value and this value will go up, which means that the gate uh, to, uh, so, uh, to source voltage will go down and this transistor will reduce its voltage and will reduce its current and finally will turn off. As expected here, the voltage is almost continues within the capacitance. And then we got a clumping effect, which means that the voltage of the source is following the voltage of the antenna. And it's going higher than the voltage of the polarization, which means that the current will drop to zero, and this transistor will just be cut. And then after, everything will continue during this uh, positive alternance, this positive half wave. Uh, the signal will continue to discharge within this resistance. Normally, this con time constant is not done for that, so it will stay for a long time. And then the capacitance will continue injecting the signal, and this is what we call clamping signal. So the signal of the antenna is clamped at the input. You can see that with the probe. You can see that your signal is really going very high. You got pulses of current and the transistor is turned off most of the time, which means that you don't uh, listen any other signal but this one. It's really killing your sensitivity. Of course, you are not supposed to receive this kind of signal here, but it may arise that a blocker, for instance, go there. And it's not a problem. It worked correctly, but, but you have to understand why at a given moment, you got a very, very high voltage here that can even destroy the chip if the voltage at the antenna is very large. That's other tool. You make this try and you have to understand why. Another try is to see marginal test at, at temperature. So for instance, you are, and we, we learn about that at, 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 in some Mathmica, we have to use band gap everywhere to have every polarizing, the gassing stuff completely locked and very, everything's controlled. And then you think you are in good shape, but not always. For example, let's see the uh, classical cascode amplifier here. Uh, the threshold of a, of a given transistor is our first uh, uh, approximation. Uh, uh, let's say a classical value at T0 plus alpha times the difference of temperature compared to T0, with alpha is a coefficient which is a couple of millivolts. It is negative, always. The absolute value depending on the technology, but it's from one, two, three, up to four and five millivolts per uh, degree Celsius, which means that for a given current, VGS will decrease with increasing temperature. We know about that quite well, but sometimes we can have problems also. So this voltage will change 
And if this one is connected to a band gap, this one will not change, but this one will change, and this one will change also. So this one will change, and we can see that it will change dramatically. So of course, if we got a jump from plus 27 degrees Celsius to minus 55 degrees Celsius, then here we got loosely for two milli two millivolt uh, alpha negative, we have minus 200 millivolt from this VGS and plus minus from this one, which means that this transistor has got 400 millivolts of drop between your its gate, its gate and its drain. And of course, due to that, it can enter its linear region, and then after, nothing will work, regardless of the fact that the bias was locked by the band gap. It is just because the band gap is here that everything collapses. So be careful. It's not because you got a band gap somewhere that you can forget taking care of actual biasing dependency of temperatures. So even with a band gap, there is a risk of change in conduction mode, and then after severe degradation in frequency performances. And of course, also in uh, amplification behaviors, it may no longer amplify at all. You need a GM disket both hot and cold condition. And of course, you have to take care of the package because the package is also got a thermal resistance. So if you got a specification of temperature that is coming from your product, you will have a real one which is coming from the chip, which is within the package that you have to know in advance. So most of the time, you are obliged to do out of range temperature tests, sorry, slower than the one and uh, the, the lowest one and higher than the highest one with a little bit of margin to be sure that regardless, the package thermal resistance, you will still work even at very high temperature or very low temperature. Let's talk about the failure test and uh, focusing on, on uh, stability. And here uh, we are talking about the Widler band gap, bipolar uh, classical uh, circuits. Um, most of the time, you are not really aware that this circuit is providing a voltage, so it is not supposed to see any signal. But still, there is a, a feedback, as we can see here. There is a feedback which is in this area. So, for instance, we got the output voltage, which is here. And then if we got a current which is a little bit too high in this resistance compared to this one in this transistor, it will generate a different current which will draw directly within this transistor. So, and in returns, you will have a very large current that will go to this current and reduce the voltage on this resistance, which in return will reduce the voltage that create this current to be too high. That's really good. That works perfectly, but it means that we are in front of a feedback because the reaction creates something which is going against. So if we got a feedback, even if this circuit is not supposed to see any kind of signal, it can be uh, uh, unstable because there is an error amplifier. So there is a risk of instability. And you have to take care of that when you're making the design. The, the, the problem here is that if you are not aware that there is a feedback somewhere because you just use the circuits for a friend or coming from, um, from, from a publication somewhere, then you will be in deep trouble. So uh, let's see how we can do that. For instance, uh, we know how to compensate for the, and it is actually the same for the amplifier than from this, let's say, band gap reference. Here, for instance, you got the major cutoff and then after two others, which means that you are in this area, in, uh, most likely you will have an oscillation right there. So. You can add a capacitance here to enjoy the Miller effect. And then, which means that you will move the major uh, uh, pole to the lower frequency. And or in this specific case, it's not enough because you can see that you still have gain when you are reaching the minus. Well, you got a very, very small margin here. It might be in stable state, but you can still further go there or enjoying the pole splitting that came from the Miller effect. So this is the way you can compensate your band gap uh, 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 reference. But if you don't know that a band gap reference is also sensitive to, curve, to let's say, signals, the noise, then you're in deep trouble. So this is, um, how can we do that? We, we can, how can we work on the stability? Well, we, it's always difficult to open the loop of a given system, because if you open the loop of a given system, you will move most of the time the DC operating point or so. And if you move the DC operating point, you will move the AC model 
to another model, which means that you are not going to compensate your circuit, but something else, which is not good. So the, uh, uh, um, the trick which is done here is that you are killing the input signal, which is here, and you add this circuit, which has a DC of zero, which means that the operating point is not moving, and an AC of one. One or two doesn't really care, actually, but something. And you're working in linear. So if you see that, if you consider that this circuit provides a signal which is named U here, for instance, here you got beta U, beta being the uh, feedback uh, parameters. Then you got A, so R, you got A beta U. And if you are just making the division, because in simulation it's easy to make a division, it's much more difficult if you are making measurement, but in simulation you can. You make division between this signal and this signal. You will then have only AB, which is the open loop of the circuits, regardless of the fact that the loop is actually closed. So if you can do that, you can then work uh, on the stability with the open loop still working in the natural operating point. Uh, so uh, this approach can be used to, let's say, in open, uh, let work on the open loop and fine tune your phase merging and gain merging by inserting capacitor in there, as we have seen previously for the band gap. Uh, and also, if you are working for something which is an oscillator, it will be the opposite. It will help you to fine tune uh, the gain that will make the circuit to oscillate, but will not generate too much of phase noise. And uh, of course, the problem is that here we are working on AC stability. AC stability is coming from small signal model. And as soon as you got problems such as oscillation, we are going in the large signal model and the model is no longer the same. So we will, it's still not enough to have an AC stability system. You do have to do that, but it's not enough. You will also be obliged to make some transient tests uh, because of this change from low signal to large signal. So you will need transient study with an impulse or a step response and look at the answer of that uh, in time domain, no longer in frequency domain. So here is an, another example of a circuit that we have designed a couple of years ago, which is a VBE generated current generators. As we can see here, there is VBE of Q1, Q1, which is uh, generated on cross of R, and all those circuits will all have the same gas current. We do that because if you can do that, you can reduce the voltage to lower than one volt, which in bipolar, it's not so even, so obvious. So, and when you make the study of that, once the circuit has been fine-tuned, it doesn't appear to be unstable in AC. But then, if you are making that, you just add here a pulse of 10 hundred of millivolts, just right there, here. And then, if you do that, Oh. Oh, okay. The current of this transistor is increasing, which can, all those transistors are supposed to have an, an identical current. So the only way to drive this current is taking the current out from the bipolar, which in return will reduce the current it draws from this current mirror entry. And then after, of course, will reduce this one, which will reduce the voltage on the resistor. That's good news because something to increase, reduce by decreasing, which means that you are in a feedback. But the problem came that the fact that this takes time to arrive. And finally, you will observe when you are making a transient simulation that the circuit is, of course, going down, but then after he's just leaving his own life because he's trying to compensate, but it's becoming like a ring oscillator because it's impossible for him to make the compensation instantaneously. And this circuit will oscillate uh, it has been measured, unfortunately, that it oscillates. We make the circuits without knowing that it will oscillate, and it oscillates because of that. Um, but it's not, it's not a sine wave simulation, so it cannot be seen on AC. It's more than closer, let's say, to a ring oscillator because it's due to time propagation of this problem that generates a full, a full oscillator. And you can imagine that if a reference current of a given chip is oscillating, the old chip is just collapsing. So we are being obliged to make a second fabrication. And how do we compensate that? That's quite difficult to do that because, unfortunately, it's non-sinusoidal, so it's not seen in AC. So the previous trick that I've shown you doesn't work anymore. So you have to do that, uh, let's say, by hand, uh, doing your best to see how it works. So here we first add, let's say, obviously, 
We got the high impedance node here, so the high gain here. So you use this capacitance to try to kill the signal to come back. But that's not enough because here current were really low, so the GM was quite low. So you also had to add a, a, a zero instead of just a pole. And of course, you have to reduce the global gain of the system by adding this one. Also. But all those has been done by hand. And it takes time to do that, to find something which will kill the oscillation in transient because you cannot do this, the study in AC because it's not obvious. So stabilization is difficult to obtain, it takes time, and you can have a delay of delivery, which is a problem. <coughs> Failure cell, but still, if you don't do that, the circuit will not be functional. Let's say the problem of the operational op operating point. The problem is most of the time, if you got a circuit which is independent of the BDD, it's been that you got most of the time, not all of them, the Whitlock band gap don't have this issue, but most of them, got more than one operating point. And there is a Murphy's law that say that if there is two or more than two, two uh, operating points, the simulator will converge on the one you're looking for, but practically speaking, the circuit which will be fabricated will work, converge on another operating point, which is absolutely disastrous for your circuits. For instance, most of the time, zero is an operating point. So as you lead up your circuits, it's starting from zero and it stays there and your reference of 1.2 volts, stay to zero, and everything collapses. So um, you have to make the operational point to be unique, and for that you have to add a startup circuit. But to know that you have to start the startup circuit, you have to be aware that your circuit have more than one operating point. So if you got any doubt, here is a, a, a way to do that. The circuit we talked about previously <coughs> got this problem too, not only the problem of oscillation, but also the problem of dual operating points. So you just take this a bit, you open the loop somewhere, and then you add a voltage that goes from zero to something in DC, and then you observe the output. And when those circuits would have the same input and output, you have a potential operating point. So it's quite easy to do that. For instance, at the very beginning, you have, as soon as V in here is lower than VBE, this transistor is not conducting, so Everything is zero here, and here this point is either zero if this transistor is off or in the between because of the equilibrium between those two transistors. So it's here I choose to put that in the between, but uh, it can be zero as well. And then when you arrive at the value of this transistor, start conducting. So it's inject current everywhere, but the voltage transistor cannot drive any current in, and it goes to saturation. So this voltage is going to VDD, to VCC. And then uh, it stays there until the voltage here is large enough to ask this transistor to conduct at its own term. And then it conducts, and of course, it, it conducts much more than this one. So it goes like that and go back to its own saturation. So that's OK. And then you just put on top of that the V in equal V out curve, and every time you are crossing the blue and the red, you got an operating point, potential operating point. You got three here. So luckily enough, this one is unstable because if it increases, it go, it's a, it actually it's a feed forward, not a feedback. But the two other ones are potential operating point, and we definitely need to remove this one because we just want this one, which is the good one where every current are VBE or called R. So how can we do that? We have to add, there is several potential solutions. The one we used was this one. You got a current which is established here that goes through the base of this transistor, generate a current in this transistor. So the, the potential solution zero does not equal anymore. And this circuit goes to the potential the solution you want. But, of course, there is the addition of this current on top of that, so you have then to shut it up. And then if this current is established, you can then cut off this one, and this one will be killed. Of course, you will consume a little bit of current here, but this one will have the one operating point you are looking for. So, uh, let's see about uh, the methodology to design for a business. First, you are designing your circuit. You are analyzing first the operating point. This is the first thing you have to do for unicity of operating point and for thermal study of this operating point. If it works, okay. If it doesn't work, you have to go back. Then you are studying the stability, if it works. 
and you're building for AC, as we have seen, but also don't forget that for transient. So if it works, that's okay. If no, you have to go back to circuit design. And finally, you are making the marginal test to see if your circuit is working exactly as you are preparing it with signal and of course thermal study. And if it works, if it doesn't work, you have to go back and make the, 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 let's say, the modification that makes it okay and restart everything from scratch every time, of course. And if it works, then after you can go for fabrication. So, uh, and you have to do that looking for a weak minimum, not a strong minimum. So that's make the difference with the super circuits that will have a very, very high performance, but with a little shift of the performances, everything will collapse. With your circuit, which have an acceptable performance, but which is very, very strong in terms of any discrepancy within the parameters. So let's see a couple of examples of design that we have done with this kind of approach. The first one is the PLL, double loop PLL, uh, which is working with uh, a ring oscillator. <coughs> For the ring oscillator to reduce uh, the noise, uh, you have to make balanced the rising and falling edge, which means that you are not making the fastest oscillators and you are not neither making the lowest consumption because the longer uh, the rising edge uh, or the falling edge, of course, the higher the power consumption. So you can work on making the NMOS, the fastest transistor, the shortest one, and the PMOS will do whatever you can. But if you do that, you will have problem. It will generate low frequency noise that will be upconverted by the oscillators to high frequency. This can be balanced only if the rising and falling edge are balanced. That's really critical. So, sorry. So here we work a lot to, let's say, have a ratio matrix between those two, which is K, and K was in the vicinity of three because it's theoretically the ratio of the mobility, but practically there is also a problem. And we make here uh, that every point here got the same rise and fall time. It's tons of simulation just to make this curve. And we can see that with different lengths of transistors, we are making those measurements strongly uh, Let's say it's quite surprising to see that with a 0.35 uh, width, all the circuits got balanced. We don't know why, but it's something we observe. But finally, we, dis uh, we, we maintain the 80 nanometers here uh, because it's both robust and not really s uh, sensitive to, let's say, discrepancy when it comes to analog. And then after, you can see that with fast, fast and small, small, we can guarantee the propagation delay we want whatever, uh, so, so it's it's a worst case analysis, and we can counteract that with the uh, body biasing of the transistor taking advantage of the FDSOI technology. Doing so, we are sure that whatever the technology, we will be able to lock the PLL, the PLL, sorry. So here is an overview of the chip. You can see the two loop, the caliper PLL. So it's a kind of self-offset PLL. And you can see here a uh, reference spurs on 10 dies that came from a wafer. We uh, have those dies are not coming from the same area. They came from all around the wafer. And you have lower than 0.5 dB of variation within the reference spurs, which means that this is a critical parameter of the PLL. This in the circuits, whatever you take the circuit, it will guarantee this reference spurs. It's just enough to go BLE, <coughs> Bluetooth Low Energy. Uh, so it's not the best of the circuits for sure, not best in class, but you can be sure that whatever it is, the yield is 100%, which is what we were looking for, a robust design. Another example is an injection-locked Quadratio DCO that was used for 5G-based station. Here you got, the, the, the gamble here is that you got two oscillators which are coupled together to have 90, 90 degrees between them which is finally an injection of those, and you add an injection of the 6 gigahertz PLL to goes up to 28 gigahertz. And everything has been done with looking for a weak optimum, a weak, uh, and then you can see that four dies only this time, we're having only four dies. You can see that there were very, very small discrepancy in terms of phase noise at one megahertz and 10 megahertz. And of course, the figure of minutes also is really, really controlled in a couple of dB thanks to the approach of looking for a weak minimum. Of course, the weak minimum is not the best solution you have, but you can be sure that all the chip will, at the end of the day, be without your specification, which is better when it comes to mass production. 
a little bit more difficult than after a few other papers accepted. But this one was accepted at RFIC back in Denver, 2012, for what I remember. And you were the chair, weren't you? Yeah. 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 The, 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 the circuit has been done by Roman, who, 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 who were from NCERB uh, just, just before you. Okay, let's talk about an IoT synthesizer based on a daily locked loop, not on a PLL this time. So here we work on the, um, let's say, reproductibility on, of, of the uh, delay element. So, and the, be sure we were having, uh, the, the, we were requiring 85 picosecond to be sure that everything will work in, in our uh, synthesizer. And so a lot of work has been done on every dimension here. And you can see that it's only three that has been used. And with small, small and fast, fast, but also temperature, we can be sure here that the tuning of this body bias, once again, will allow, will allow us to guarantee that the circuit will fulfill the specification regardless small uh, slow or fast slow slow fast fast so every corner will be okay and then this is the synthesizer itself so it's delay locked loop here which is factorized and there is a multiplier dll and there is a calibration loop that follow that to lock every time and then after you get the validity, there is 10 dies here coming from the same wafer, but all around the wafer. You can use different reference frequency because this is uh, this uh, is multiplexed. So there is a counter here that allows you to decide how much time you want this ring oscillator to react like a voltage control delay line. And you can observe that there is a very, very few discrepancy on the phase noise at 1 MHz and also the RMS jitter, except for this one. We just don't know one of those die was working Let's say differently, but it's working better. But still, uh, that's, an, uh, that's the, the very, very small discrepancy because of the weak over optimum that was targeted at this time. And uh, last but not least, we are talking about the fract and synthesizer, like this morning, but uh, this one is much simpler. It's just using a very, very special divider, which is making the fractional division natively, which is a bitrate modulators that was used in the old time uh when uh, when we were trying to let's say lock the, the speed of a motor dc motors without having the microcontroller at this time so the brm has been invented in the 60s and forgotten in the 17s when the microcontroller arrived but we just use it to make a fractional divider and the phd defense will arrive on next monday uh, this is the work of denise for those who know him. Uh, so here is the, we are working with an oscillator, which is two ring oscillators coupled one together to have a different, so the differential one. So one of these inverter here, another inverter on the other chain, and two latch that will synchronize both the inverters that are each of them in a single regulator. And so here it is, once again, slow, slow, slow and fast, fast. And here are the BLE band we want to look for. And we can see that whatever the technology, we will be able to lock on the good frequency, uh, whatever uh, will arrive to the technology, once again, working on a weak uh, optimum rather than a strong optimum. So, and here is a measurement. So you can see here, the BRM is, is acting like a fractional divider by its own, no longer uh, relying on the dual modulus average. It's really generating fractional uh, output and here is the spur rejection of this circuit on 10 die and we can see that once again we have something which is in the vicinity of 2 to 4 db of variation regarding the frac spur and the reference spurs without any titter addition such as the decima modulators which made the thing much easier the power consumption much lower and then more suited for iot so, and that will conclude this presentation. Uh, the robustness is really a major constraint as soon as mass production is considered. Unfortunately, it's not that much studied or uh, educated in, in academia because it's better to have something which is the best. And uh, we also have to talk about money. And at a given moment, when you have secrets which are a large discrepancy, even if one of them is the best in the world, at the end of the day, your production cost will be unacceptable. So you have to work on that, taking that like a constraint, like, for instance, power consumption or, 
or temperature or whatever, cost is a constraint, a major one, maybe the major one. Uh, robustness leak on weak minimum, that's really important. Most of the time, if you use an algorithm of optimization, it will focus on strong minimum. Here, we are talking about mass production, robustness, and sensitivity. So we need weak minimum as a target. And that's not so easy to, weak, to, to target on weak minimum because it's uh, the second delivery have also to be zero, which is not so obvious, but sometimes it may arrive. At least you have to work on that, reducing the second derivative. And uh, you have to take this this dispersion into account, at a, but it requires a very good technology modernization and it can cost time. So the, 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 the really the leader of the group has the responsibility of stopping the team when you are spending too much time on trying to have something which is perfect. Perfection is not from this world and you will spend time to run after that. So it's a problem, but you will have to rely on your, let's say, senior designers to say, okay, we have to stop right now. Uh, designing for robustness may require some resource, but we have seen that resource finally is not the critical problem. The critical problem is time to market. If you have to spend more money than required, but will allow you to go in good times in the foundry, that's perfect. Please enjoy doing that. And finally, and, and that's uh, design for robustness is based on trade-off, trade-off because of weak uh, minimum rather than pure performances. And this is why most of the time it's difficult, especially for researchers, to target on, on, on this kind of robustness. But trying to have the best of class uh, is always performances. Uh, you are going to be engineers in the practical world, so please take that into account. And that's it. Maybe you don't have question, that's not a problem. Yeah? Very important slide 41. 41. Oops. Is this one? Uh, okay. Yes. There is a figure of merit. Yes. What is, uh, what is this figure of merit? I mean, what is it, is it based on? Oh, I don't remember which one we use. It's the one that has been used in ITRS uh, most of the time because it was an injection lock oscillators. But, well, it's it's a VCO. Most of the time it takes into account power consumption and the frequency tuning range and phase noise. Most of the time. It's a kind of balance of all that. It's a figure of merit which is used classically by others. So it's just a matter of, let's say, bay marking your circuit with compared, compared to others. And most of the time, if you are doing weak uh, minimums, uh, you are not the best in the class. But here, what is important is that it's good enough to go for 5G. So that's the, 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 but you, you have to be sure that everything will be in line. That, that's really the difference. Yeah. Um, first, thank you for your talk. Thank you. Um, I would have a practical question. How could you Draw your your error function in which parameter would be key. Like, would you would you draw your your error function for maybe the transistors or the passive elements, or would you couple some of them? Actually, you don't draw it. It, it is just an illustration. You just don't know where it goes. Yeah. So you are going at random. So, so mm -hmm. you are, that, that's a mono variation. You are changing this one. Oh, it doesn't go the good direction. If you increase the power consumption, for instance, and it works better, that's fine. You are in the good direction. But if it works worst, then you have to reduce. And then you are, it's a kind of, uh, let's say, a taton. I don't know how to translate that in English. Um, but uh, yeah, yeah, of course it is. You have tons of parameters. Here I just use two parameters because it's easier to represent. If you've got just five parameters, uh, I just don't know what to represent that, on the, on the, but but still, you are making you got your simulation, so you know you got you know the parameter you have in your hand. I don't know resistance value, current, voltage, something like that, and you you have to select one of those, making the variation. It works. Say okay, you you have a minimum because you make more than one, or, and then you stop. You take the other one, and and so far and so forth, and then you restart. You are doing that by hand. Sometimes you can do that with an algorithm in a software. Most of the time, you are doing that by hand. It takes time to do that. But if you don't do that, you will have a good circuit, but not necessarily a weak minimum. 
you have a circuit which follow which answer your problem specification but if something move a little bit it will move also but if you work on trying to find a weak minimum then you can be sure that your circuit will be robust that's the difference between a circuit which is good and a circuit which is robust it takes time but that's definitely something that will increase the yield and we have seen that the yield have an impact on 20 percent 22 percent on the cost return so that's significant but because time to market is worse you don't have to waste your time too much on trying to become really robust at a given moment it's a trade-off So the trend of PhD you have creates that we also have a limited number of dead labs. So should we prioritize something that works, uh, like having a weak minimum with extremely wide margins, or should we try to maybe uh, get an absolute minimum and uh, like be able to publish something in a very good conference? Well, being able to publish that something, but um, especially for uh, someone like you, you have a PhD which is granted by an industry. Okay. Uh, the industry is not really interested in publishing. Of course, it is a little bit because uh, someone here about the fact that you are making good circuits, that's always good, but you are really looking for production and making money. So uh, uh, making a circuit for publication, that's something from the academy, not, normally not from the industry. On the other hand, you're right, you got one, two run per PhD in, 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 in Europe because you just have three years. That may be a little bit different from the US, but uh, you got three years. At this time, you have to make a choice. Sometimes, um, sometimes you cannot find an optimum, but you can see that it doesn't move that much. So that, and some, sometimes if you are not sure of the functionality of your architectures, because you are making a new architecture, then you have to take the risk. But you have still to look a little bit on the side of your circuits, because if the circuit is going to fabrication, you just have two run. If the run is coming back and that the circuit is zero, then you waste your time as well. So even if you are just taking risk, okay, because you see that finally, if you are just making Monte Carlo simulation and you are taking the risk that 1% of this circuit will be out of the spec, but if your circuit is one of those 1%, well, I think there is a bad mark for you and you have to do something with, uh, let's say, uh, the karma um, at this time. So, uh, yeah, I, 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 we already take that risk more than once, but it is because making the difference proof of concept to go for a product. That's make a difference. But to go for the product is just engineering. Just, it's very important, but I said, you already know that it will work. You have to put 10 men instead of one, that's okay. It takes, what we talked about, an overrun of resource, it's not a problem, an overrun of time, that's critical. Okay, thank you. So happy you are at the from uh, <laughs> from the <laughs> Ah, merci. Merci. Yeah. So uh, wait, we're going to take a few pictures, if you don't mind. So, Bongwa, can you come? Oh yeah. Ah, uh, oui. Un fond. 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 Uh, oh, yeah, sure. Can I just Of <laughs> we can do it the other way around. On peut faire l'inverse, on peut prendre la photo ici si vous voulez. Je vais projeter chaque branche, je vais mettre. Vous pouvez prendre la photo de la bi-branche. Vous pouvez les élèves de l'intérieur. Je vais mon écran, ça je ne suis pas au point. Je vais mettre ça, c'est bon. Parfait.
Yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Just here. Yeah. I suppose you oh, yeah. there, there. Uh, you know, you know, if you want to send me the middle. Because you are the chair, chair, and 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 chair, Il y en a qui peuvent s'asseoir à l'ici en train de faire un peu On a le drapeau là, ils sont Non, non, là-bas. Monsieur, là-bas. Oui, c'est ça. Non, là-bas. Ah, ça marche. 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 Ça Allez, on dit bi à 3. 1, 2, 3. Bi. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Comme ça, en même temps, je m'en fais maintenant un truc. Je faisais ce qu'on a. C'est dommage de ne pas sensibiliser davantage au pognon. C'est la méthode du Macron Test. Si, si, on fait sur 56 domaines aussi C'est le premier qu'on fait, parce que c'est facile, entre guillemets. Mais le problème, c'est que quand on va voir si on a des fessiers à ce moment-là, on a assez comme ça, mais il y a des fessiers à ce moment-là, il y a des fessiers à ce moment-là. Oui. C'est toujours des gars, là, c'est à 300 mètres à place. Oui, ok, d'accord. Donc, on fonctionne quand c'est lui. Donc, on les voit pas. Et c'est aussi pour ça qu'à la fin, il faut toujours demander un peu plus. On vérifie que Il sort jamais 